Um, so thanks for inviting me. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Good. Um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I really like the paper. I agree with much of it. I think the neuroscience is really cool. Um, if, uh, of course, if Dan and I agreed about everything, and uh, he just wanted to call it mechanistic explanation, and I wanted to call it holism or emergence, this wouldn't be a very interesting discussion. Um, I think most of us at this point, if you think of the spectrum, uh, on one end, the machine analogy with, you know, fixed functions, and on the other end, you know, the holism Dan talked about where everything does everything, which means everything does nothing. I think most of us are somewhere in the middle, and we're having a discussion about the middle. Right? I hope that's the case. Yeah. So, okay, good. So, um, so here's where Dan and I definitely agree. Ad atomism, to use his lingo, is dead on arrival. That was the main point that Tony and I have been trying to make. So if the mechanists get that point, I'm, I'm happy if nothing else happens. Uh, the second thing that I agree with Dan about is that contextualist decomposition is one reasonable project for cognitive neuroscience. So I think that's a, a good thing to do. And of course, that wasn't our target. The target that Tony and I had was atomism, and Dan agrees atomism sucks. So I'm happy. Um, so I think to get to some place where you know we, there's some interesting disagreement. Let's, maybe not, maybe Dan will agree with all this, I really don't know. I think, let's focus on his claim that um, contextual decomposition can save reductionism of the sort. I want to know more about what he has in mind by reductionism here. Because what Tony and I stressed is that in systems neuroscience, and not just Tony and I, Olaf Sporns and other people, as Dan knows, is that, you know, to use Dan's lingo, context sensitivity whether you want to character, characterize it in terms of dynamical systems or network theory or whatever, involves context, context and constraints at multiple spatial and temporal scales, including, for people like Tony, the wider physical and social environmental scales. So we're talking about multi-scale interactions inherently. And that's not just a function of ignorance. That's really the nature of these systems. So, and of course, that means that if you wanted to think about this mechanistically, if you wanted to continue to think that way, then you'd be saying that parts of these mechanisms uh, involve large swaths of space time, well, well outside the body or the head or the brain or what have you. And maybe, you know, but not computationally. This isn't wide computationalism, which I think Dan already agrees is a non-starter. So here's the point. If, if, as I think Dan seems to agree, if what parts do is a function of other processes at various scales at a particular time and across time, then there's certainly no part whole reductionism here, certainly not, any not in any metaphysical sense. Now, maybe he thinks there's still some methodological reductionism here, and, and maybe that's true. I would, I would have to hear more than what he has in mind. And certainly, this certainly doesn't look like localization, because what was the dream of mechanism that they would explain things by going to smaller and smaller spatiotemporal scales and smaller and smaller regions of space-time. And that just doesn't seem to be what's happening here. So uh, if Dan thinks that, I'm going to make one more point after this, but if Dan thinks that all that is compatible with reductionism in any robust sense, I need to know more about what he has in mind by reductionism. Now, I think the last point is maybe even more telling. One of the things that Tony and I stressed when you talk about these networks, is that what's doing the explaining isn't the structural bits. It isn't the cells, for example. It isn't the mechanistic brain bits uh, it, or whatever they're contributing to. And I think Dan's right. They're contributing to lots of different things, and that's fine. It's the network properties that are doing the explaining. And these properties are robust. They're universal. They're stable. They're classic with respect to very fast changes in the structural properties. So the arrow of explanation, when we look at the network stuff, isn't from structure to function or structure to network. It's the other way around. And these explanations have a kind of universality. They're autonomous with respect to changes in structural properties. And Dan, at the very beginning of his talk, makes this point. He says, this is what Tony and I say, and he's right. But I don't think anything he says speaks against that particular point. So while I agree that contextual decomposition is a worthwhile project. My worry is somebody might take it 
uh, as being designed to save the idea that the primary explanation is still issuing from the structural bits and activities, that they are the fundamental explainers. And I, I don't think that's true in these network cases. So that might be one real difference. So let me just end by, by trying to say it another way. What explains contextual decomposition? What explains the fact that these bits and these parts are so adaptive to contextual changes in very small time scales? In other words, what explains universality, robustness, and plasticity? And I think Dan agrees, and this is the point I tried to make in my BBS piece in response to Anderson's, uh, you know, the target article on his book. We make a big deal about this in neuroscience, but this is just the nature of complex biological systems. So I think the neuroscience or brains are just one example, right? We could talk about phenotypic plasticity or all kinds of other things, and the point would be the same. And what explains these features? And what I want to say that whatever explains these features of these biological systems can't be localization and decomposition because they're systemic features. So in my language, right, contextual emergence, that's the, the lingo I would use, explains contextual decomposition and not the other way around. So the fundamental explanation does not issue from structure to function. And if just, if I may, here's my new book from Oxford where I talk about uh, contextual emergence. And uh, Robert Bishop and I have another one coming out, more focused on biological systems. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, great. Um, Thanks so much, Michael. Um, I definitely look forward to reading the book. Um, we, uh, as I suspected, there's so much interesting sort of half agreement and half disagreement going on between us that would take a really long time to cash it all out. Right. Um, so let me just say a couple things, and then and then we'll have to say for uh, for for another day. Like you know, we could spend hours, um, and it'd be quite fun. Um, well, let me just let me just say on that point. New Orleans is my favorite city in the United States, so invite me, and we can have this conversation. <laughs> as, as, soon as, my, as soon as my $800 per year budget gets renewed, you will get a call. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and also, just stop by any time. Any, anyone wants to come to New Orleans. So, right. um, so uh, let me just say two things in response. So let me take the later, the latter point first. Okay. Um, I agree with you that there are, there are explanatory contexts where the, the explanatory framework we're going to focus most centrally on is going to be a dynamical explanation or a network explanation. Um, however, I will not agree with the verbiage of fundamental explanation. Um, so I've actually got a couple of other papers that I think I cite in this paper where I argue that uh, in general, for any, any interesting explanation, we're going to, it's kind of a pluralist point. We're going to need multiple coordinated ways of representing that system. So in a way, I agree with you that it's not, there's not like one fundamental type of explanation. On the other hand, I'm going to disagree with you that when we talk about um, uh, particular sort of system functions, like we're going to switch between different forms of fundamental explanation. I think the story is much more complicated than that. Um, so that's a whole thing. I'm give, uh, anyone who's going to the SPSP in Belgium, I'm giving a talk about this. Uh, uh, Can I just do one little? So, as you know, I've always defended uh, explanatory and causal pluralism. Mm -hmm. So, as a matter of scientific, you know, progress or what have you, I totally agree with you. The yeah. reason, so I'm I'm happy to back off saying one is essentially more fundamental than the other. Yeah. In in the explanatory realm, the only yeah. reason that I do say that sometimes is because of the fights that I get into with the metaphysics of science people okay, who, are con that. who are convinced that the world is really part-based, right? Yeah. So when we put it in a metaphysical vein is when I'm inclined to... So, so that's really interesting to me because you know, I read your stuff and, and I have my particular reaction to it and I, I, just, I don't have a metaphysical bone in my body. So I kind of, I'm kind of right. not sort of having that particular thought. Right. Um, so, so, uh, so I think we agree about that. So now let, me, let me, now let me go to the sense in which I want to talk about reductionism. I don't want to say, unsurprisingly, I don't want to agree with the sort of like metaphysical reductionist that there is some sort of just like rigid structure in the world where um, all of the, the macro physical properties are just sort of like tieable directly to some consistent set. I mean, I obviously don't right. want to say that kind of thing. Right, right. The kind of, of 
reductionism, and you know, maybe this is moving the, bump, the goalpost, the kind of reductionism I'm interested in is when, I, when we want to explain some, for instance, cognitive phenomenon. Um, should that cognitive phenomenon be described as purely in terms of uh, in terms of dynamics or purely in terms of network. So some of Tony's stuff, for instance, does suggest, right, we've got, we need a new paradigm for cognitive science that is purely dynamical. Um, uh, and, you know, and then, of course, you know, there's complexities to that view. Um, so what I want to suggest is for a given um, exponendum, for a given, for instance, cognitive exponendum, uh, for instance, sensory motor decision making, right, there's still a coherent notion that says we need to look at the different things that the networks are doing, and and that's and that's an explanatory norm, right? So it it is a methodological reductionism. That's at least what I want to what I want to argue for. But then there is something stronger, and namely we 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 miss an understanding of the system if we don't pursue that particular uh, that particular thing. Now, uh, one a bunch of really interesting stuff that you said that I do not have worked out is like what is the overall network structure such that um, such that uh, that gets instantiated in the right way in a particular context. That's something that I'm really interested in working on more in the in the, in the future. Arnon Ruby has a nice paper on uh, uh, the flat view of of neuroscientific unity. So sometimes I'm I actually am firmly toward this idea that that what the connectome is is this kind of like field property, right? Um, and what, <laughs> we need, what we need to be looking at is specific, so we, we grant that, but then the exponent for any particular thing is how a particular uh, set of interactions within that field will go. And then I'm interested in can we decompose that set of, set of interactions. But that's incredibly flighty and vague, and this is like, you know, years in the future of what I want to think about. So there's all kinds of interesting stuff that we agree about, and, and we got to, you know, if we, if we get a chance to talk more at some point, we should really try to nail down exactly where we're where we're, uh, where we're at with this. But yeah, uh, uh, really interesting. Thank you so much for the... For Thank the you. I really enjoyed your paper. Great. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. And um, I'm happy to be here. I really enjoyed the paper. I totally, my uh, expertise is basically has a neuroscientist, but during this last year, I took the decision to get into mostly philosophy of mind, and I, that's why I'm here. Oh, great. Uh, well, I'm sorry for you, and we're happy to have you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I, 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 I enjoyed the paper. I have a, a um, I will just make a commentary, uh, two commentaries. The first one is about what you called, um, uh, I mean, the, you, you make a big bridge between brain activity in the form of patterns, there are local potentials and oscillations, to uh, cortical activity. Okay? Now, that is a bridge that you just make it because in fact that is a fundamental problem in neuroscience now how actually a, a oscillatory activity emerges in the brain and how that relates with activity in specific ar cortical areas now mm -hmm. the problem with one you have a statement for instance in the paper that you didn't uh, 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 say now in in, in, the, in the lecture but you wrote it and you say that um, this form of activity, oscillatory activity, is how the brain works. You almost literally say that at certain moment in the paper. And the problem is that most of the brain activity is think noise. I mean, actually, if you go to any brain area and you try and you plot any brain signal and sample to a high frequency with an electrode, and you plot that in a logarithmic scale, the frequency versus the power, you get a think noise, it has a slope that is mm -hmm. different to the white noise. Mm -hmm. Now, what is interesting about that is that that is the real, most of the brain activity actually think noise. That is, that, that is quite fascinating because uh, the problem is how come a, a, a structure has the brain, that is most of the think noise actually sometimes, from time to time, you know, generates very small, I mean, this is minimal, very small, and very difficult to, uh, to, 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 to read out brain uh, form of oscillatory activity. That is one thing I just would like to point. Now, the thing is that um, the most basic form of brain activity that is oscillatory was discovered before, long before the uh, brain oscillations in the hippocampus or in the brain. The, oscil the, the oscillatory in the hippocampus are one of the strongest ones. That is why they are so well investigated now. But the one of the oldest ones has been central pattern generators in the spinal cord. That is really well established. Now, the difference between this form of brain activity in the cortical hippocampal or uh, 
central pathway generated in the spinal cord, is that uh, while neurons, for instance, in the cortex are extremely, how you say, poison, uh, poison distributed activity, the neurons in the spinal cord are often more, often fundamentally rhythmic, far more, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. at least in the central pathway generator. Then in certain way, certain networks have some kind of, you, uh, some of the cells components or that networks, for instance, have much more rigid intrinsic properties, okay? Actually, most of the, uh, that is one interesting aspect of that. Then there is some places in the nervous system where you have more like, you will say, people say often these are hardware, you know, stable properties, and they are more intrinsic in certain way. But in certain, I don't know if that really, you know, uh, by definition, is close to the atomistical perspective. But mm. my perspective when I've been working with, you know, I, I, I am biologist, uh, but I have been working with people with a lot of molecular biology and with electrophysiology, these kind of things. I mostly work with animals, though. The, the thing is that we were focused fundamentally, hardcore neuroscience is about to find the neural components actually build up that oscillations, you see? And what you find it out is that even in neuron has flexibility, they don't have infinite flexibility. Actually, mm. they have mm. a specific range of resonances and anatomical structures. Then the question is that at a certain level, there is a, the, these components have limitations, but they do build up flexible outcomes at the level you are describing. My, my criticism a little bit is that you use some example from brain oscillations and jump to that, but at that level also there is a problem, I would say, of the composition in atomism, isn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a further problem. Uh, uh, all, uh, uh, the problem that you place in this paper, I have the impression, exists at different levels of organization. Do, do I am, I, 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 I don't know, I, I wonder, in that aspect, I think today I have some kind of like um, uh, empathy for the, uh, I mean, I understand a little bit the emphasis of the previous um, uh, um, uh, panelists make it, make it in the sense that yeah. there is some kind of aspect of, 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 of uh, that is very common to biology. Uh, I, I just will leave it there, and I appreciate very much your presentation. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, yeah, th thank you so much for, for the comments. I, I really love when I you know, give these talks to neuroscientists and they can point out where I've undersold the, <laughs> undersold the details. Um, so, so, let me, so let me just say a couple things. Um, first, um, I guess let me take the second part again. I mean, one thing that you're stressing, and I, and I think you're, it's really interesting and totally right to do that, is that you know I've been really touting how flexible this is, um, but you're right that it's not infinitely flexible. Right? There's going to be uh, some mechanisms that are in charge of or, or lead to the production of these particular oscillatory patterns. Those are going to be hardwired in some sense. So there's a lot of um, there's a, a fair bit of literature about theta gamma interactions and the neuromodulatory and um, circuit properties that produce those. Um, and I'm not, I, I have not dove as deeply into that as I should. Um, uh, and one thing you might say is, look, if you're really in interested in that hardwiring and that limitation, then what you might think is, yeah, there's got to be, the function has to be tied really closely to that, that hardwiring and that, that sort of limited set of capacities. And then the interesting question is how to scale up from there. I think if you really, if you really, if you take that as a motivation, uh, then you end up at something like Michael Anderson's view or something like Charles's view. Uh, Charles, let me know if I'm, if I'm uh, massacring one of your, one of your motivations. Um, where, yeah, what you need to do is specify the intrinsic hardwiring thing and then explain how it gets scaled up into, you know, functional complexes, as Anderson would put it. Um, I uh, resist that for a number of reasons. One is because I, for some broadly, you know, philosophy of science reasons, I don't think we get, uh, I don't think we can get explanations of what a part does just by looking at its intrinsic functions. I think we need to talk about uh, the different ways that it gets employed in different contexts. Um, the other thing I want to say is that, um, so you're totally right that diving down into these, into these really detailed hardwired and neuromodulatory structures is one of the goals, but that's not the only goal, right? So um, one of the really interesting things about um, oscillations in the hippocampus is that there's a hypothesis that it's driven by the medial septum. Um, one really interesting hypothesis about these more widespread cortical networks is that their particular oscillatory schemes are uh, in part set up by thalamocortical interactions. 
Um, so yes, there are going to be these uh, detailed low-level mechanisms that are producing the oscillations, but these themselves are going to be in, in uh, interaction with other parts of the network. And one really interesting hypothesis that I want to sort of pursue more is to think about these sub subcortical areas as sort of really central, really central hubs for coordinating um, uh, some of these oscillatory some of these oscillatory dynamics. Now, I mean, these are kind of hypotheses at this stage. Um, and I haven't, I haven't made my way through all the, the literature on final cortical interactions yet, but, it, but uh, I want to suggest that, like, yes, there is one motivation that says, let's just dig into the hardwired, uh, hardwired bits of neuromodulatory stuff. But then there's also another motivation that quite reasonably, I think, wants to uh, situate that uh, amongst both the broader cortical network and in relation to uh, subcortical areas and see how those, um, see how those interactions give rise to um, these these specific functional interactions at the of the kind that I'm talking about. Um, okay, so Dan, this was a great paper. It was careful and it had great neuroscience. Uh, and I think I I think I uh, have a pretty good understanding of the the position you're going for. Uh, I guess my main question has to do with. Um, well, I, I push back with sort of offering a deflationary view of your thesis. Um, before I tell you that, let, let me just say you, you made reference to my work a, a minute ago. Um, so if you were talking about my um, uh, localizing intrinsic functions uh, paper, I think that's maybe just a little bit off to the side from the discussion that we're having now because my main idea there was that if you want to explain particular physiological properties of cells or things like that uh, of neural structures, then a bunch of stuff follows. Um, but here, it's not clear that the target is physiological properties. Um, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, okay. But I do actually have a paper in Synthes um, in which it's not about neuroscience. It's about complex systems in general uh, and, and networks. Um, where I do challenge the sort of mechanistic approach to science uh, in general. Um, and th that seems a little bit more relevant. So what I'll say right now is sort of related to what I say in that paper. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, so I, I have it. In, I, have, I just haven't gotten to it. I was going to read it before I wrote the final version of this. Oh, uh, no, yeah. Um, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> if you read it, it's the very end of the paper that... that okay, good, good, good. Uh, anyway, so... Um, I guess here's what I've said. The examples that you use are directed mostly towards behavior. Mm. And I think you do a good job showing that decomposition can be a good strategy, even if the elements that result from the decomposition process have different functions in different contexts. And I agree with that. Um, but then you also say that one of the factors that generates a context is the frequency or maybe the frequency band of a local field potential. And so here's my question. What if the focus of our inquiry is the nature of the local field potential rather than a particular behavior or cognitive operation? So we might ask questions like the following too. Um, how did this local field potential come about? Or why is, this local, why is the local field potential now on the delta band rather than the theta band? Um, so you say that you want to challenge an inference, right? You want to challenge an inference from dynamics to non-decomposability. And I think there's a little fuzziness there. So I agree that that sort of inference is nothing like a rule of logic, right? It can't be a it can't be sort of relied upon in all cases. Um, but I don't think anyone else thinks that it can either. Um, rather, what um, uh, Silverstein and Chimero and, and m maybe uh, Anderson and maybe myself have said in various ways is that for some kinds of target systems dynamical and network properties will make mechanistic decomposition an unproductive strategy. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering, uh, in, in light of my characterization of that inference, how would you respond to the question, um, you know, about the local field potential? So why is the local field potential now in the delta band rather than the theta band? That's the question. Now, what does the philosopher of science, you know, bring to our methodological or epistemological discussion of how to answer that question. Yeah, yeah, cool. It, it really, it really nicely actually combines the last two, the last two points. Um, so, um, 
uh, a couple of things I want to say. So um, first, um, so there's kind of there's kind of two points. One is the uh, for certain kinds of system point. Uh, so I, I so we have a disagreement here, but I, I think we, we need to get fine grained about what the disagreement is. So. Um, and, and actually, I think, I think a lot of what I'm doing here is I really want to separate out largely the, the points that I agree with uh, in the things that, that y'all say from the points I don't agree with so much. Um, so as, as I was talking about with Michael, I do, I do in fact think that for certain kind of explananda, for certain kinds of properties in the system that we might want to explain, um, there uh, will be more focus on particular forms of explanation than on others. Although, again, I don't want to think that it's fundamental. Um, uh, but I don't, uh, so it also might be possible that for, for, for certain kinds of systems, uh, mechanistic explanation comes out to not be the right kind of way to go. Uh, if that's, if, so, so I agree with qualifications about the first way of putting it, about the kinds of systems thing, uh, I just disagree about the cortex, right? I just don't think the cortex is one of those systems. Now, uh, I've only given one case, right? So obviously, uh, just as I don't think holism implies logically, uh, contextualism is not going to imply uh, is not going to be implied logically. There might be other systems for which the system's intuition is right. If that's the, it, but now what's happened is now now I see my contribution as being here's a here's a set of principles or here's a kind of uh, uh, here's an example or an exemplar of a, a decompositional scheme that is not in fact falsified by these particular properties of complexity in this particular system. Here's a kind of an idea, a way of doing it. If you want to be uh, a mechanist again of this mechanism 2.0, dynamic mechanistic explanation kind of strife, if you want to be this kind of mechanist and you think that decomposition is central to mechanistic explanation, which I do, here's a way of going about it, even in a system that we all recognize as complex and dynamic and, and network mediated. But I expect, you know, we're going to have to go have the question about cellular, uh, uh, cell signaling networks. We're going to have to go have the question about gene regulation networks, and um, and I don't suspect that what I've said uh, carries over immediately to those systems. Obviously, but I do expect that, I, or I do hope that this is a kind of way of thinking or, or a way of thinking about how different components, uh, different properties of the system might interact. That could be maybe a springboard for thinking about other systems. Uh, and now I'm just going to admit, you know, uh, I just don't, I just don't think the brain is one of those systems where we where we can't do the decomposition. Good. Um... I'll, I'll let the next person go. I'll just say shortly. I, th I think we're closer to agreeing than you're making it sound. Oh, okay. That's your response. Yeah. Okay. So. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 Well, what we really need to do is, is you know, all need new errors and just like really sit with cocktails and have this out over a long period of time. <laughs> I have a. Uh, I'll try to go through quickly for the purposes of time, but I have a um, one, you know, sort of comment and then a, a, a comment that opens to a broader question. Um, the first comment is I just think that uh, atomism is, uh, as characterized in the paper, is really a straw position. So I think that there's no sane and sober view of functional localization in the brain that doesn't allow for some contextual variation. So uh, if you think about the sort of, you know, classic view that the basal ganglia are involved in adjudicating between uh, or choosing between among a bunch of different motor programs, right? Then you might say, well, you know, what the basal ganglia is doing in any particular instance depends on you know, what set of motor programs it's being fed um, and, you know, how that conflict is going to get resolved, but that, you know, it has some kind of overall function of, well, in each of these cases, it resolves conflict between motor programs, right? So at that kind of abstract level, it's always doing the same thing, but nonetheless, there must be some fine-grained level in which it's, you know, doing different things in different circumstances. And I think that would just be true of the dual system or, you know, any kind of system that <clears throat> acts differently on a bunch of different inputs, which, you know, has to be the case. So I, that was just one comment. I think the more uh, interesting of my comments is the sort of worry that I might call the turtles all the way down worry. So I think you're right that contextualism doesn't necessarily entail holism, but I'm worried that it may. So, uh, you know, just take your example. Um, I'll say, let's just uh, agree with you, right, that when uh, a certain set of brain areas have a certain assignment to the three parameters you talked about, that it will perform a, a specific function. So let's say, you know, parameters uh, A, B, and C are tuned to one, two, and three, uh, where these parameters are, you know, things, uh, 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 you know, phase locking, coupling, things like that. And then uh, you can memory taking place. But for all we know, 
that all happens because there's some other parameter, let's call it theta, that's held constant, right? So that, you know, in these studies, you can tell if the system is doing uh, episodic memory or uh, a different kind of memory. Um, but like there's some other parameter that's held constant that were that to vary, um, those systems could be set to those parameters and that behavior couldn't be taking place, right? Or another way to put it, um, you know, just take any of the parameters and ask, you know, why does the neural system that does that have that parameter? And maybe there's some other set of contextual variation that results in that, right? So that, you know, one, two, and three all now have, you know, one of, say, a few different contexts that determine whether they adopt that parameter as opposed to another one. And yes. then multiply that at an item. Yes. I contend that that at least would start to appear like a form of holism or would sort of reopen the door to holism. Uh, so while I, I, I completely just agree about the kind of contextual um, properties that you're pointing out, I'm just wondering if this sort of opens the door to a type of holism. Yeah, um, good. So, so uh, your, your straw man point is something that definitely needs to be addressed. So I'll start there. Um, I have a very long footnote in the paper where I talk about exactly exactly this kind of view. I mean, um, the way that I think that this gets implemented, so it's sometimes people in the reductionism debate really do talk like you. Sh it should be able to do it in a Petri dish. They talk that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think everyone agree, everyone should agree that that's a, a very silly view. Um, and especially when we get into the brain and behavior, right? Um, so in this, in the, it, in the footnote, and I really should just put it in the main part of the paper, although I'm worried about length, um, is, uh, look, usually this gets dressed up some way. So, for instance, uh, if you're interested in MT, obviously MT is not going to process motion information um, without uh, a, a privileged route of displacement information to it, such that the inputs it has are displacement information over which it can do whatever kind of Fourier decomposition is going to do to construct the um, to 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 uh, uh, construct a representation of the motion energy of the stimulus. Um, usually, um, when people actually you know talk about this view in the brain, it, some some of that is in the background, right? So there's some assumption that there's some privileged route within the system such that we get one kind of function being claimed by this area. And this is how this interacts with, with discussions of modularity too. So um, uh, in, in, the neural, in the neural context, I call, this, I call this absolutism, this kind of picture of the system where you, the system is arranged such that this particular part only ends up subserving this one type of function. Now that of course is compatible with MT, you know, representing leftward motion versus representing rightward motion. So I totally agree with you that um, all of that needs to go into constructing a reasonable view. On the other hand, I think um, absolutism, as I've phrased it in these other papers, is a kind of attempt at atomism. It's an attempt to glue down individual functions to individual parts of the brain and then explain the whole brain in the, uh, so it meets this rigidity and uh, directionality thing, even though we need to dress up intrinsicality a lot to, to, to get the function there. Um, but of course, it's really difficult to define intrinsic properties anyway. And I just realized I forgot to cite Carrie's papers on, on, on this, where she goes through you know, incredible depth. So I mean, what I'm really after is, is, is the kind of intrinsicality that generates um, um, uh, uh, rigidity and directionality in the ex in the explanation. That's really all that I'm I'm trying to foist on the atomist. Um, but you're right. I should be a little more careful about how I do that in the paper. Um, so I hope that's at least somewhat helpful as an answer. Um, so uh, you also raised this really really interesting point about sort of like um, in a way it's context all the way down, but in a way it's possibly context all the way back. So uh, another thing that Marvin and Huderman raised, but again I should probably put in the paper is uh, a regress argument against, against contextualists. Um, and you see this in a, in a variety of cases. So um, maybe um, there's, uh, um, so, so think about even if it's true that, excuse me, the MTL is coordinating the memory recall context from a temporal to a spatial, well, there's obviously got to be some way that um, the, MT, the MTL is getting the information from uh, for instance, auditory centers that are processing the question or semantic centers that are uh, understanding the question, you know, which store was closer versus which star was farther away. I mean, 
Uh, in a way, I want to agree, but in a way, I want to also say this really maybe lame and unsatisfying thing where, uh, look, we're investigating causal processes, and there's always going to be, you know, another step we could go back in the chain. And then the question is whether, so we all admit, when we're, uh, at least we all should admit when we're studying mechanisms, that there are going to have to be parsings that are going to have to be, okay, now we're drawing a, a circle around this system and treating what's coming in as, as granted. What I would suggest is that that process is much more flexible than atomists and reductionists and criticisms of, critics of mechanism generally take it to be. And then the question is, is only, well, is that pernicious? Does being more flexible now mean that we can't do this thing we're within a given context? Now we're going to draw the circle around the mechanism and treat this as, as input to it. No, no, I mean, I'm, I'm open to the, to, the, to the possibility that, okay, maybe even the, maybe even the auditory processing of the stimulus um, integrate so closely with this that we can't do that separation from the auditory processing of the stimulus to the um, to the MTL selecting the modulatory scheme and, and multiplexing context that's going to actually guide recall of the memory. Um, on the other hand, so I admit that that's a possibility. On the other hand, I see no reason not to be hopeful from the kind of from the kind of analysis that I've done. So, for instance, if you if you complexify the sensory, mo so I talked about that sensory motory sensory motory uh, sensory motor decision making task. If you, complex, if you complexify that task a bit and you incorporate aspects of spatial um, attention into it, such that you now need to look at the right stimulus from a set of distractors. Uh, so it turns out, you, in, in that case, you need to do that. You need to attend to the stimulus in order to uh, get to um, the, the, the right task. Um, however, if you, if you look at, at those contexts, um, you get the same beta network involved, but you also get uh, uh, synchrony in gamma between an, a different uh, uh, network involving not only the visual cortex but also um, the the frontal eye fields and the parietal and the parietal cortex. So now we've got a slightly different network at a different frequency that's underlying that aspect of the task um, uh, than um, the the frontal parietal uh, sensory motor decision making network kind of takes over. That's at a different frequency. Quite interestingly, um, the PPC is overlapping those two processes. So the hypothesis here is like that's really a hub at which the attended information now gets um, gets uh, uh, interfaced with the new network for performing the decision task. And so that's a case where we've now gone back one, right? We've gone back to an attentional process that's prior. Uh, and and we've now gotten a uh, a different story about uh, about th what's going on in that subcomponent of the task and how that relates to uh, the, the the task we've studied so far. So I, I don't see any in principle reason why one couldn't sort of keep going back in this way and uncovering different aspects of the function. Now I don't know maybe in the long run that'll circle you back around or something. But but I see no reason not to. I, I see no reason that that has to be the case. And I and I, I certainly don't see any reason not to pursue it. But that being said, I think you know I think you, that's a really good worry, and and it's the kind of thing we have to go investigate if the contextualist position is on the table and we take it as feasible and we want to go really plumb the depths of whether it's really going to work out in the long run or not. So in a way, I want to say like thank thank you for the uh, the extra explanation that my view in, inspires, and we need to go and we need to go look for that. Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dan. This, uh... I heard this paper before in a slightly different version of ish, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, I, I first wanted to go back to uh, <clears throat> Ernest's comments about uh, CBGs because I think actually this is also fodder on your contextualist uh, view because uh, the CBGs, even in the spinal cord and also in other systems, are also able to switch. Uh, rhythms uh, contextually, uh, depending on which kind of neuromodulators they are uh, receiving, and so um, it seems that although, of course, at a certain in a certain sense they're more rigid than cortical circuits, they're also multifunctional and uh, con and their function is contextually dependent. So I think actually the <coughs> CBG example does uh, um, support your view rather than challenge it. And if you look at the history. The CBG researchers once had the hope that they could explain the rhythm as an intrinsic property of the connectivity, but they gave this hope up in the 70s 
because they saw that they weren't able to, they were not getting able to, to do it because they uh, um, saw these circuit switching uh, phenomena. <clears throat> Um, what's interesting in the more recent literature is that there seems to be some sort of like homeostatic mechanisms by which these circuits recover uh, this rhythm that they have to execute over, often over the lifetime they have to execute the same rhythm. So it seems to be rather the stability of the phenomenon that they have to contribute to, let's say, breathing or digestion and stuff like that, or like being able to walk at all that they have this sort of rigidity, so it's actually a phenomenon rather than the circuit properties that is, that, that is involved in the stability. That, that would be my, my explanation here. Um, still, I want to ask you, push you a bit more about uh, cortical circuits and oscillations, because um, I, uh, in, in the paper you write at um, several points that um, gamma oscillations, for instance, could index these different kinds of representations um, and I was wondering how these researchers, from which I think you received this sort of view, um, support this inference, because there's, there's also evidence that, that these gamma oscillations have a quite ir irregular uh, a relationship to visual stimuli, for instance. And one possible explanation is that they, the gamma oscillations themselves do not represent the information content, but the circuit act activity level. And the circuit activity level, of course, co-occurs with, with some type of information processing. It's just not that the gamma oscillations themselves are somehow the carriers of that information. And so the problem then becomes like, how can we infer that when we have the presence of these oscillations, this has actually to do something with the information processing, then and not with other functions that you know these infrastructural functions that I talked about in my yeah. in my paper, where which are also context dependent, but the context here is more how active the circuit is and when you have to prevent damage rather than the behavioral context to which that circuit responds when processing information and like it's. It, it, it seems to me, to me, it seems like more difficult to make these inferences that than you make look by quoting these sort of correlational studies where you find that there are frequencies uh, when when you look at uh, 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 these different tasks. Yeah, yeah, great. So um, I have a suspicion. I have a suspicion that uh, maybe maybe we we'll get to this point with uh, with your question. Um, yeah. So I mean. Uh, you're totally right. You're totally right that. Um, oh, thank you for the CPG, by the way. When when I was when the master was raising that question, I had this uh, like uh, intuition that I should just say like Philip saved me. <laughs> uh, but uh, so uh, yeah, I mean the CPG case. I, I I would just have to go look at it more. I haven't studied. Sure. I need to go look yeah. at it and like see. Where, and this is interesting, right? Because it seems like it, it's a case where it's sort of maybe more rigid. Uh, but there's also going to be some contextual variations. One way, one, I mean, one kind of cool thing we could go look at, maybe all of us, would be to say, like, oh, okay, like, you know, here's a really simple circuit with a relatively dedicated function. When, yeah. when do we make the switch, right? In, what, in, what, situ in what, what kinds of properties force us to make the switch from an intrinsic analysis of the wiring to a contextual analysis? And that's something, that's something that I think all of us kind of eventually will need to worry about. Because I don't deny that there are sort of intrinsic uh, um, circuit properties. I don't deny that, uh, you know, against either uh, Ernesto or against Charles. Um, the question is just about how far those are going to get us in the explanation. But now, if you if you if you, uh, right. if you agree with both of those points, now there's this interesting question. Okay, well, what's the switch point? Now, where do we where do the resources of whatever the intrinsic properties are run out, and where do we now have to start thinking about about the way that that those um, uh, whatever those intrinsic properties are are, are interacting with the the, the 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 task or whatever the context is. Um, so that's a really interesting point that I that I need to think about more. And yeah. When we get to when we get to my my flagrant cognitive myopia. Um, so uh, there's a couple of things. There's a couple of things I want to say here. One uh, is you know your challenge is well taken, and I don't say enough in the paper about so so for instance. Um, uh, if we want to be good mechanists about this, then these, then arguably these need to be interventionable properties. 
Um, so there are a couple things to say there. Um, there are some studies using uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation that attempt to um, interrupt certain aspects and patterns of the um, uh, of the of local field potentials and measure the effects on specific behaviors. And there is some evidence, although I need to I need to put it in the paper, that you can get. Uh, specific interruption of specific behaviors from specific interventions upon specific LFPs in specific parts of the brain. But of course, that won't tell against your infrastructural view, right? Because if these are just necessary non-cognitive parts, for instance, in game control, then interrupting them, of course, will also interrupt the, interrupt the task. So even though there is that interventionist evidence that's not purely correlational, won't get me all the way there against your objection. Um, now, there's something more to be said, though. So uh, and, and this is something that I, that gets to your point, which is a point I definitely need to get more clear on about exactly. So there's some unclarity in the literature about exactly GABA's relationship to spike firing, and some people are much more sanguine that GABA is a direct um, uh, uh, key, uh, clue to what the what spike what in, uh, spiking is doing or what the spiking behaviors are, and some people are less sanguine about that. Um, the, what I want to say about this, though, is that there's some evidence that um, from decoding methods that suggests that all of these components are functional. So for instance, um, if you measure um, uh, spike frequency, uh, spike, spike behavior and LFP in primary visual cortex, you get a much better prediction of what, for instance, the monkey is looking at by conditioning both on spike frequency and on uh, LFP than you do uh, looking at either one of them alone. Um, if you uh, uh, look at visual cortex, I think this is done in humans, you get better prediction of, um, of what humans are looking at by look, looking at multiple components of uh, LFP frequencies across multiple cortical areas than you do, um, uh, than you do uh, looking at any of them individually. You also get more information looking at phase and amplitude than you do looking at uh, either one of those alone. So this, um, I think, as it is at least suggestive um, that it's not just the spiking doing the work, it's also the spiking as a function of background LFP. Now that's suggestive, it's not, it's not, um, it's not uh, uh, definitive, but it does explain, it would explain why the spiking frequencies that we take to be uh, directly relevant to the to the cognitive performance do exhibit these very detailed these very detailed relationships to the background frequency. So you have to have a talk. Yeah, and it's possible. You know, if we all embrace contextualism, then it's possible that, um, that for instance, gamma frequencies could be playing both a gain control function in your sense and a, and a multiplexing function in, in my sense. And the great thing about contextualism is that there doesn't have to be a conflict there, right? Um, yes. the, the last thing, the last thing, and then uh, please follow up if you want. The last thing I want to say is that this actually allows us to talk to another thing that Michael and Tony talk about in that paper, which is this idea of um, uh, kind of redundancy in explanations. So I think Michael, you guys talk about these kind of physics explanations where once you know the 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 Hamiltonian or whatever it is, you know. Um, then, then you, you have all the information you need about about what the parts are doing, given the uh, given the positions of the parts. I've heard the exact example you use. Uh, that's probably not it. Uh, but uh, there's this way that um, all of the information you need is in the system is in the system variables. And maybe this goes back to one of Joe points, Joe's points as well. All the information you need to say what the system is doing is in the system variables. So, and, the, and in this case, the direction goes the other way. We explain what the parts are doing in reference only to the system's variables. That's all the information we need. And I actually think that these, that these decoding results suggest that that's not the case in this, in this scenario. So um, we, uh, uh, we, we do need, we do need the, the broader uh, variables, yes. We need the, the synchrony between uh, LFP components in multiple brain areas. But that's not going to get us all the information either, right? So we need, um, uh, we need that information in addition to knowing the, mo the modulation scheme, as we saw in the Canolti case. Now, of course, decoding methods, you know, we shouldn't be overly we shouldn't be overly impressed by them. Like they're interesting and they are what they are. Uh, I do think they're suggestive in this in this case, but I don't think I, I, mean, I take the point, and I don't think that, that that that's totally solved. Another another difficulty, and then I'll shut up. Is um, uh, another difficulty is you know, it's hard to study the modulation. 
it's hard to study the modulation schemes at the level of grain that Canolti et al. do. Um, and that's not something I think that's currently, uh, uh, even in subdural recordings, I don't think they have the resolution to study at the single cell level. I'll have to go check on that. I don't think they have the resolution to study at the single cell level exactly what the, the modulation schemes are. Uh, and that's something we need more information about as well. So we have some cases that are suggestive here, some cases that are suggestive here, but you're right, the whole picture is definitely, definitely not on the, on the table yet. Uh, 